Thank you, Con. It's good to be here today with you and with Ian Sterling, the President of CEDA, and uh, the three Vice Chancellors, Warren Bevington, David Lloyd, and Michael Barber, and the Chancellor of Adelaide University, Robert Hill, uh, and uh, Con Tragakis, of course. Uh, he and I have a relationship in a, another form, which is our two sons play for the same football team at the Paynham Norwood Union Football Club. Uh, he was the runner last Friday night, and for those of you who want a really big horse laugh, I'm the runner on June the 1st, uh, which will be, I was volunteered by my lovely wife who thought it would be terribly funny for everybody, because I haven't run anywhere for years, except out of the chamber, actually. I once run, <laughs> ran rather famously out of the chamber. This week's federal budget contains the biggest reforms of higher education in 30 years. Oh, and David Pisoni, the Shadow Minister for Education. Sorry, David, I didn't know that you were here following me around today. I hope the singing here is better than the singing at Adelaide University today. This week's federal budget is the biggest reform of higher education uh, in the last 30 years. The higher education reforms are a fair and balanced package that spreads opportunity for students and ensures Australia will not be left behind. By 2018, an additional 80,000 students per year will receive government-supported places in the courses of their choice. I want Australia to have the best higher education system in the world, and these reforms will help achieve this ambition. In a speech at Monash University last week, I set out my vision for what the best higher education system in the world would look like. For me, the best higher education system would provide more opportunities for students from all backgrounds to choose the course and the type of higher education provider that is right for them. There'd be a wide diversity of good choices for students. In the best system, higher education would be affordable for students with no upfront costs for them. Costs would be shared fairly between students and taxpayers. The best higher education system in the world would continue to recognise that disadvantaged students need additional support to enrol and complete higher education. The system would provide world-class teaching and research with some of our universities being among the very best in the world. All higher education institutions would be pursuing their particular goals as well as they possibly could. In the best higher education system in the world, students could choose to study where and what they want and universities and higher education colleges would have the freedom to provide the very best education in the world to meet the needs of their students. The government's role would be to help students and promote research, uphold the quality of the system without unnecessary red tape and make sure the taxpayer's contribution to the cost is well spent. The world's best higher education system would enhance both quality and access. It would provide good information to help students and their parents make decisions about study options. It would prepare students for the jobs of the future, not only those that exist now. The best higher education system in the world would give universities and colleges greater control over their budgets and their capacity to attract and keep students. Universities and colleges would not be weighed down by unnecessary red tape and would be trusted to do what they do best, excellent teaching and research and nurturing students. The higher education reform package in the budget will help lay the foundations for achieving such a world-leading system. With this vision in mind, in framing the federal budget for higher education and research, the government faced five significant challenges. The first was that we must, be, we must repair the national budget, given the unsustainable budget deficits and ballooning debt that we have been left with by the previous government. Secondly, Australia's higher education and research systems are at risk of being left behind and overtaken by the growing university system in our region. Third, growth in the number of higher education students as a result of the introduction of the demand-driven bachelor degree places is driving up the cost of higher education to the taxpayer. But there are compelling reasons to expand the demand-driven system to support more students spreading opportunity further for students, which is what we are doing in the budget. Fourth, the previous government also left us with funding cliffs for essential research programs. And fifth, we had to meet all those challenges in a way that are fair and reasonable, both to the students and to taxpayers. 
In confronting these challenges, it became increasingly clear to the government that we needed far-reaching reform. The resulting higher education and research reform package has five major themes. Expanding opportunities for students, a sustainable higher education loan program, a sustainable higher education system overall, investing in research excellence, upholding quality. The reform package takes very careful account of consultation through processes including the Lee Dow Braithwaite Review, the Kemp Norton Review and the National Commission of Audit. It draws on much discussion over many years on how to spread opportunity for students and how to ensure that Australia has the best higher education system we can. It also draws on the many informal opportunities that I've had to consult with the higher education sector both before and after I became the Minister for Education as well as the considerable interaction between my department and my office and the higher education sector. As a result of these reforms, for the first time ever, students studying at any registered higher education provider will have their place directly supported by the Australian Government. This includes higher education students at TAFEs and private education colleges. It also includes all accredited higher education diplomas and advanced diplomas, as well as associate degrees and degrees. These reforms will expand options and pathways for students less well prepared for university, while funding a wide range of qualifications that lead straight into jobs. Professor Peter Lee, the chair of the Regional Universities Network, has welcomed this, saying we are particularly pleased that the government has decided to keep the demand-driven system for bachelor places and extended it to sub-bachelor places. This will assist in providing pathways and lift participation in higher education in regional Australia for less well-prepared students. Andrew Norton from the Grattan Institute and one of the co-authors of the recent review I commissioned on the demand-driven higher education system has said, TAFEs and pathway colleges meet the needs of a wider group of people seeking higher education. Students who arrive at university via a pathway college do much better than would otherwise have been expected given their prior school results. Supporting students into diploma pathway courses will reduce dropout rates for students who enter degree courses before they are ready because places on pathway courses are currently either unavailable or more expensive. Andrew Norton went on to say, although the academic outcomes are good, in private colleges students have to pay fees that are often five to $10,000 more than they would pay at a public university. Noting that under the government's reforms, many of these students will pay much less than they do now. In addition to supporting an additional 80,000 students in these ways, we are freeing universities to determine their own fees. The level of student contributions will be determined by what universities and other higher education providers charge and by what students choose to pay. Universities and colleges will have to compete for students and when universities and colleges compete for students, students win. They win through a better range of courses offered to meet their needs, through greater focus on the quality of teaching and other support for students and on price. We will never have diversity of choices for students and the quality of courses that we need without fee deregulation. Competition between universities and colleges will help to prevent fees from rising excessively. Some fees will go up and some fees will go down. We can be confident that some will go down because for the first time ever, the Commonwealth will be supporting all students in undergraduate courses from higher education diplomas to bachelor degrees. With 80,000 students funded for the first time, some fees must go down. The new system is fair and reasonable because students gain enormous private benefit from their education and it's reasonable that they pay a fair share of the cost. The taxpayer currently pays 100% of the cost of an undergraduate's education up front and on average students only ever pay around four out of every $10 of the cost. Students are not required to make any payments up front they take out a loan from the taxpayer through HELP and only begin to make repayments after they're earning over $50,000 a year. 
For students, the decision to invest in their own future is the best investment they will ever make. Australian university graduates, on average, earn up to 75% more than those who do not go on to higher education after secondary school. Over their lifetime, graduates may earn around a million dollars more than if they had not gone to university. Higher education is worth it, and students know it. Quoting from Andrew Norton again, historical experience suggests that prospective students from low socioeconomic backgrounds are not generally put off by higher charges if income contingent loans are available. No current undergraduate students will be impacted by changes to student contributions. They'll be grandfathered, supported on the current terms until they cease their current studies or until the end of 2020, whichever is earlier. Our package of reform has a very strong focus on equity. Higher education students will continue to be supported by Australia's world-renowned higher education loan program. Those loans ensure that students do not face upfront costs and do not repay until they are earning a decent living. As I said, no student needs to pay a dollar upfront. For the first time, apprentices will also have access to income contingent loans to encourage more young people to take up a trade and complete their qualification. This is through the government's new HEX-style trade support loan program. We are also eliminating loan fees that apply when students borrow to study under the VET fee help and fee help schemes. This will mean students can borrow on the same terms as each other rather than the current unfair inequities that exist between the private and public sector. The government did not accept the recommendation of the National Commission of Audit to reduce the thresholds for repayment to the level of the minimum wage. We believe that students should only repay their loan from the taxpayer once they are earning well above the minimum wage. A new repayment threshold of 50638 will apply from the 1st of July 2016, and at that level graduates would only have to pay 2% of their income in repayment of their loans. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds will have access to the largest Commonwealth scholarship scheme ever. Higher education institutions will be required to allocate one in every five dollars of additional revenue they raise from student contributions to a new Commonwealth scholarship scheme. Students will receive individual tailored support from their higher education provider through the new Commonwealth scholarship scheme. This will include needs-based scholarships to help meet costs of living, as well as fee exemptions, mentoring, tutorial support and other assistance at critical points of their study. This will help many students from regional Australia and outer metropolitan areas, many Indigenous students, low SES and others who are first in their family to access and complete higher education qualifications. The scholarships will allow the best students to get the best university education that is right for them. This is in addition to the extra support being provided by extending the demand-driven system to students studying diploma, advanced diploma and associate degree courses so that they can access a pathway to a bachelor degree or a qualification that leads directly to a job. Additionally, the Higher Education Participation Program, HEP, helps disadvantaged students by funding universities to undertake activities that improve access to higher education for people from low socioeconomic status backgrounds. It also supports disadvantaged students to remain in their course and complete their qualification. The new Commonwealth scholarships will provide a very significant boost to resources for these activities. The reforms will allow universities and higher education providers to compete more effectively for students. As a result, students will have a more choice and universities and colleges will need to put more effort into meeting the needs of students. They will need to become more innovative and continuously improve the teaching and learning they offer in order to attract students. The demand-driven system of undergraduate places has greatly increased access to university undergraduate degrees for Australian students, and this is something we applaud. But it needs to be financially sustainable. Uncapped student places are now estimated to cost an additional $7.6 billion over the five years from 2013-14. Given our national budget challenges, it's essential that the higher education system remains 
on a strong and sustainable financial footing. And this means there were some budget measures that resulted in education reductions in funding, ending programs that don't work or requiring additional contributions. But the overall spending on higher education rose by $900 million over the next four years. As part of a government-wide decision to streamline and simplify indexation for programs, payments to higher education providers will be increased with inflation using the CPI from the 1st of January 2016. Also, universities will be able to charge research training scheme students undertaking higher degree by research courses a contribu contribution towards the cost of their degree. I'm very pleased that the budget includes an ongoing investment in essential research programs. Research addresses the world's most pressing problems and challenges being faced by mankind. Research in Australia helps our successful businesses grow and increase their earnings and boosts Australia's overseas exports. It helps ensure that we keep jobs in Australia. World-class research requires high-quality facilities and talented researchers. Yet the previous government left us with a situation where there was not a single dollar set aside for the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy beyond the 30th of June next year. And there was no provision for any new awards for the Future Fellowships Program that supports mid-career researchers to undertake world-class research in Australia. So we will provide $150 million in 2015-16 for the continuation of the NCRIS. This investment is supported by the findings of the National Commission of Audit that quality research infrastructure is a critical component of Australia's research and development system. A review of that strategy will commence in the near future, which responds to the Commission's recommendations that the government commit to ongoing funding for critical research infrastructure informed by a reassessment of existing research infrastructure provision and requirements. The government will also fund 100 outstanding mid-career researchers every year through the Future Fellowship Scheme. These researchers will each receive funding for four years to undertake their vital research. This will reduce the risk of brain drain where our best researchers can leave Australia for jobs overseas. It will contribute to maintaining Australia's long-standing re reputation for producing world-class research. The Future Fellowships Program will be an ongoing program and $140 million has been provided for this over the next four years. The budget also delivers on our election commitments to direct research resources to key national priorities. Australian Research Council funding has been reprioritised, including $26 million to accelerate research into dementia as part of a larger $200 million government initiative on dementia. $42 million to expand the Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine at James Cook University and $24 million to support the Antarctic Gateway Partnership in Tasmania. This is in addition to the $35 million over five years through the Australian Research Council that has already been provided for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation's Clinical Research Network. The budget also establishes what will be the biggest medical research endowment fund in the world. The Medical Research Future Fund will grow to an investment of $20 billion. This fund has the potential to enable Australia to be the source of treatments and cures for life-threatening diseases, including cancer and heart disease and many others. A key element of the government's plans for higher education is to give universities and colleges the freedom to do what they do best, excellent teaching and research. Quality will be upheld by increased competition and by ensuring that the body responsible for ensuring quality in the sector the Tertiary Education and Quality Standards Agency focuses on its most important activities. Quality will also be driven by providing better information for students and their parents about study options. Students need clear information about the quality of their course, how successful previous graduates have been at securing jobs and what other students and employers think of the course. An expert reference group has made recommendations about how this information can be collected. The new information will be presented in an accessible web-based format from later this year called Quilt. The reform package has been designed to ensure Australia's higher education and research system is not left behind. This risk has been highlighted 
Our Universities Australia, in their campaign, keep it clever. I agree with Universities Australia on the risk of being left behind and, the ne and that need not be the case. As I've noted before, while five years ago there were no Chinese universities in the top 200 universities in the academic ranking of world universities, today there are five. In the same period, only one Australian university has entered the top 200, joining six Australian universities already there. My aspiration is not to only to keep up with our competitors, but to keep ahead of them. To do this, Australian universities and higher education colleges must not stand still. We must give them the freedom and the confidence to be the best they can be. Deregulation of the higher education system has been widely supported. This includes statements by Andrew Lee, the former Professor of Economics at the Australian National University and now a Labor Member of Parliament. Labor Shadow Assistant Treasurer and Shadow Minister for Competition. In a book he wrote in the last 10 years, he said Australian universities should be free to set student fees according to the market value of their degrees. A deregulated or market-based hex will make the student contribution system fairer because the fees students pay will more closely approximate the value they receive through future earnings. He also said market-based hex will also improve our higher education system by making universities even more responsive to student needs and educational outcomes. Much needed additional funding will be available to universities that capitalise on their strengths and develop compelling educational offerings. The result will be a better funded, more dynamic and competitive education system, sector. The move, the move to these new arrangements will be carefully planned. The changes to funding arrangements will not take effect until the 1st of January 2016, giving higher education providers time to prepare. And the government will continue to work with the higher education and research sector to develop the details for the implementation of the package. These reforms are about spreading opportunity and making sure Australia is not left behind. I believe they are fair for students and fair for taxpayers and create the context in which they can develop the world's best higher education system in Australia. Thank you very much.